Very good. Um, so today's popcorn theory seminar is being given by uh, Sandra Swandrini, who we, who's here from uh, the Iowa IAS and FADOA. And we'll be talking about uh, a gentle introduction to ADS3 CFT2 and integrability. Please. Thank you very much for the opportunity of giving this talk. So uh, the idea of the talk is to present some recent uh, progress in applying integrability to ADS3 CFT2, but I want to give a review of the whole idea of using integrability for studying ADS CFT even more, more generally. The case of ADS3 CFT2 is of course particularly interesting because it's richer than other ADS CFT setups and it can be studied by many many techniques. So here I think that uh, is a particularly interesting and potentially dangerous for the speaker situation because basically I'm trying to study here something uh, that is very similar to what people here are expert of but I'm using slightly different techniques and maybe I have a slightly different point of view and that can create confusion so you should ask questions immediately because maybe I'm talking about the same thing that you that you have in mind but I'm using slightly different words and that immediately should be clear about. So <clears throat> let me try to say what I want to study in general. So I want to study something like correlation functions of local operators in ADS CFT. So that means something like a two point function in the CFT. I guess maybe I should write over Decker, which should be something like this. It should depend on some number to <clears throat> the dimension of the operator. And in string theory, I should be able to see this as having the string worksheet and putting a couple of inter insertions here. And then, of course, if I'm really careful, it is just an approximation because there are higher genus corrections. Okay. And so on and so forth. And then I have O1, O2, O3, and I don't want to write everything in detail, but of course here I start having a new object, <coughs> which is a structure constant. And here I have some combinations. Of the distance dependence, which is fixed in terms of the delta, in a way that also comes from just conformal times. And this would be now three sections. So, in principle, by integrability, which is what I want to discuss in the talk, there are some techniques to study all these, but it gets way harder as long as you go beyond the planar two point function. So, for the purpose of this talk, I will be talking about this guy. So, for this talk, what I want is the planar string spectrum. So why I call it spectrum? Because of course this number here is the dimension of the scaling operator is the eigenvalue of the scaling operator for this particular O and that corresponds to the dimension of some string state in the dual string theory okay and before talking about ADS3 CFT2 I want to make a couple of examples of these deltas just to That's yes are, are there any subtleties about this just being a sphere with just two functions and not at least three or more I mean, it just makes your life much simpler. It means that essentially, this sphere with two puncture, you can think of it, and we will see this as a cylinder, which is the string propagating in some fixed target space, which would be some ADS3 crosses D cross, you'll get it later. Okay? But that's essentially the, the great advantage. And I will come back to this picture. More questions? 
Okay. So let me just say something about spectra. Now, what do you mean by planar in the context of ADS3 CFT2? I mean no genus corrections. The worksheet is a genus zero. Okay. If this were ADS5, this would also mean the planar or source limit in uh, n equal four. And if I knew exactly what the dual theory, it might mean some large and limited the dual. But I don't want to just make assumptions about the dual. Okay. Any more questions? So, spectra of free strings, this means strings where, which cannot split, they can just propagate like this in some fixed target space. And there is one that I think probably all of you know is the flat space spectrum or the spectrum of super strings in flat space and this is it has some features but it's fairly simple it has a closed form expression And it's also fairly degenerate. So the spectrum, the energy of a string in flat space, is something like square root of some number, which I will call maybe R square, just some number that tells you something about how you fix your gauge, plus four, well, the four is not really important. Here there is a parameter which I call lambda which has something to do with the tension of the string and plus n delta, where n is the sum of the various n i's and then tilde is the sum of the various n tilde i's that appear in your string state. So your state Depend on these nice and on these until dies. Because it's created by a bunch of oscillators, right? So this is the spectrum of short strings. In flat space. And when I say that it's degenerate, I just wanted to write this formula explicitly, you see that the result does not depend individually on all the various excitations that I put in these alphas. It just depends on the total n. In fact, there is one more condition, which is a matching condition. We really want to be precise or almost precise. This, of course, is a bit of a sketchy way of, of writing things, but it gives you a flavor. So, it's a simple spectrum, it's an extremely degenerate spectrum. This is a short string spectrum. Like, meaning that I'm acting by some little modes that change a little bit the excitation of the string. Let's make another example of spectrum, which is less familiar. It's the spectrum of super strings, I guess. Also, these ones were super strings in ADS5 crosses 5. And this is a bit hard to imagine, but it so happens that it's dual tonical for superior means, so we can relate it to the spectrum of the dilatation operator in planar n equal 4 superior means, which just means as large n, spectrum of single, single trace operators. And uh, the first thing that you notice here is that actually here the spectrum is complicated as opposed to simple and I will tell you why and is also non-degenerate
What I mean by complicated? Well, you start with an equal force of miss, you have a bunch of operators that at zero Toft coupling, the Toft coupling is related to the string tension in some way, at zero Toft coupling, all have engineering dimensions. So let's say that the scalars have dimension one, every operator that's a certain number of scalars, say n scalars has dimension exactly n. It's very degenerate. But then you know very well that you start doing one loop calculations and two loop calculations in an equal form like this, perturbatively if you want, and you will see that all these levels tend to spin. Of course, you will still have multiples of whatever symmetry algebra of the superconformal algebra, but a bunch of operators that at the same dimension at at three level, we'll have different dimensions. So let me make two, two examples. There is one operator, which is usually called the 20 prime operator, but it's basically the Lagrangian, or is that to the Lagrangian, and this guy happens to be protected as dimension four. Or dimension two, the, since there's the multiple, it is always a little bit subtle, which you count as the, the highest weight guy in the multiple, but I like to say that the Lagrangian has dimension two, four, sorry, in four dimensions. And then there is another guy which is called Konishi. And it actually starts out looking very much like the Lagrangian, but then you compute and you get the 12. There is some correction here in terms of this guy which now has the interpretation of the Toft coupling. And I think it's like, there's a little number here, which is 12, that's the lambda square, and it's 36, and it doesn't look so bad. And then, you know, like there's 348 or something, also doesn't look so bad. Then you get to some order, and you start seeing things that are a bit less reassuring. So you see some number, I don't know, I will write random numbers, but then you start seeing zeta of trees and then you start to see multiple zetas at higher and higher order with some coefficients. And it turns out that people have computed this thing by several ways, up to five loops, even 10 loops. And they have some explicit expression, perturbatively, but this thing doesn't look like anything anything that you can express in closed form at finite lambda and say, oh, it is just some hyper geometric function or something like that. There is no simple way to describe this quantity other than, well, it is the dimension of the condition operator. That's what it is. It's not, any, it's not the square root of anything. It's not this hyper geometric function of anything. The good news, and I will come back to this, is that not only we can compute it in expansion of lambda, we can even compute it numerically for an intermediate values of lambda, lambda equal 12, at very high precision, as high a precision as you can realistically want. But it's a very complicated spectrum, and it seems that it's generically very different from this spectrum. All the degeneracies are, are lifted, uh, basically each multiplet of the, the, of the symmetry algebra sits by itself, and the dimension of these guys looks absolutely non-trivial. Eh? So now, with this little uh, uh, setting, I want to come to ADS3. Are there questions before I do that? Okay. So there are actually a bunch of ADS3 backgrounds that you, for which many of the things that I say would go through. And they are ADS3. Can you read if I write here in the yes. dark area? You might want to pull the other blackboard down. Ah, there's another. Oh, sorry. Thank you. All right. One quick question. Yes. So are, are these things also convergent and toft in the planar limit? So yes, that thing as uh, that expansion as a finite radius of convergence in the in small lambda and I can analytically continue. By the way, in general, as a general remark, when you are at G to zero and you expand in the Toft coupling, things are sort of fine. But you start instead of doing the expansion in the loop count in, in the genus counting parameter, G string essentially, or in one over n, that's actually much harder. The convergence is much worse. So I was saying ADS3 backgrounds 
And I will be talking mostly about this background, ADS3 cross S3 cross T4. I actually will not say that much about T4. Most of the story will be about the ADS3 cross S3 part. Or you could have a K3, or you could have an S3 cross S1. And some of the things that I say will also go through for these backgrounds. All these backgrounds, they have the same amount of supersymmetry. They preserve the same amount of supersymmetry, which is 16 real superchargers, half as much as a DS5. So if I have this, background, this, this geometry, and I insist that I want to have a background with this metric, there are actually two types of way of realizing this. I can have a B field or I can have no B field. Okay. So there is a, a setup without any B. And in that case, I need some Ramon, Ramon background fluxes. Then I can have with a B field, and therefore there is some H, which is DB, as well as the Ramon Ramon background fluxes. The simplest way that you can think of these background fluxes is that it's a three-form flux, which is the volume of ADS3 plus the volume of S3. Or, if I tune in a smart way the coefficient of B, in particular, I make it as large as possible, I don't need any from or among background flux, and I can solve the supergravity equation even if I don't have any more than one, three, four, or anything like that. So what does it mean as large as possible? Isn't the gauge field a periodic variable? Come again? It isn't a gauge field, morally speaking, a periodic variable? What did you mean by saying as large as possible? Uh, so essentially, if you solve the equation, uh, the supergravity equations, in this case, you will see that the coefficient in front of the uh, of the H and of the Ramon Ramon three form flux, the sum of their square is related to the radius of ADS. Okay, so for a fixed radius of ADS, I can make oh, I see. There's one flux, there's a bit larger. Flux ADS3. Sorry, there's flux in both. The, the, there's flux in the non compact space as well. I see, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We both are quantized. Yeah. Essentially, so. everything here, everything that uh, that happens for S3 happens for ADS3, otherwise you would be breaking some supersymmetry. That, that's uh, what happens. Then you can also play with the T4, so you can start doing things on the T4, t dualizer on some of the circles and get a little bit more uh, more uh, more structure from there, but I will not talk about what you can do on the T4 because it's, it's less interesting, I would say. More questions? Yeah. The, 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 the... Uh, the, the comment is why quantization in AES3? But that's. Uh, quantization what? will come in a second. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so. Okay. Now, uh, but starting from this, from this case, after this case, after it turns out that the straight nonlinear sigma model. Is a very. It's a given by some action, which is a very special type of action. Is a best mean of intermodal. And we know that the level of the best mean of intermodal is quantized. Okay. Here is not the case, but you still have a best mean term, which has a, the coefficient there is quantized. For which group? So here you have the isometries of, AD, of this ADS3 is SO2, 2 which you should have, and this you have an SO4. The SO4 you can think of as SU2 plus SU2, and this you can think of SU1,1 or SL2R plus another SL2R. So the Bessel mean of Vitter model will have essentially 
two copies in a way that I, that I will describe. Everything sort of splits into, uh, into two, and there will be an SL2R and an SU2. And the more interesting part is the SL2R, which is a little bit more subtle than the SU2. So I guess SL2R on its own would have had a continuous level, but you're tying its level to the SU2 level for supersymmetry? Yes, the, the, the two levels are, are, are tied together. Now, uh, whether uh, if you just had SL2R, uh, you could still have a nice uh, unitary spectrum for the string uh, with a continuous level, that's, that's a little bit more complicated. It depends, essentially, in a string theory, it really depends on what you're putting here on the whole geometry, and therefore you can get some different levels depending on what you write here. But if you have S3, then it will be the same level. Yeah, or or more, more precisely, the two levels will be related in some way. I don't want to I don't want to enter in that way, but essentially you can think it either you can, you can think it is the same level, or you can think even more appropriately that you do the vessel written construction for a super algebra instead of the, of the algebra, and then the level is just one. There is there is no choice there. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you what the algebra is. Okay. All right, so we have these, two, these three cases. So one, two, three. And this guy here, I, I, I stopped. It's the level K, which is some integer. So and here, let's see if I have some color shock. I assume so. Okay. So this guy here is similar to ADS5 process 5, morally. Meaning that qualitatively you have the same the similar structure. There are that there are more among fluxes also in ADS5 process 5. And I would argue that the spectrum will also look as, as complicated. It's a bit both for me to make this statement because I don't have an equal force superior base where to do this calculation. But I will come back to this statement later. And then you have this case where actually we know very well what the spectrum is because precisely the Vesuvian model, and people have been studying a lot how to deal with these models and how to do these calculations, even in the complicated case where you have this own compact guy, which sort of makes your life a little bit harder. But I think starting with, uh, I mean, of course, people here in the audience are, are great experts, but already 20 years ago, I think there was some clarity on this and more work has been done, even recently. And what you find is that, yes, the spectrum is a bit like the spectrum of flat space strings for what concerns the short strings. So it's very degenerate and it can be written in closed form. And another thing that's a bit special is that number three, as also so-called long strings. So I, I will say qualitatively, well, people in the audience can explain this much better than, than I can, but essentially when you, have, when you have strings in ADS, ADS acts as a confining potential for the string. It costs energy to make the string bigger and bigger in general. On the other hand, the B field acts as a centrifugal force. And when you are in this special case, very special case, you can have strings that stretch all the way to infinity or to the boundary of ADS rather. And then there you can make with tiny, tiny energy, as small an energy as you want, you can make some fluctuations perturb a little bit the string. So this long string actually have a continuous spectrum of excitation just because they are so big that you can make as small as you want a, a, a perturbation of them, as opposed to the closed strings that are somewhere in the middle and you can deform a little bit, but by a discrete amount of energy, as you see there where the spectrum, the spectrum is this. These long strings are not there even in two. Even if you deform, you just go a little bit away from the, okay, the case three, the long string is up here. So you can actually deform continuously a 
from 3 to 2, infinitesimally, and the long strings disappear. Related to a discussion that we were having at, over lunch, I will say that when I say that you can deform continuously, I mean that even in this picture where you have you are in the near horizon geometry and you have three strings and you just have a supergravity background, you can make an infinitesimal deformation of the fluxes in the supergravity background. And of the you can get this thing by basically switching on some axiom in, in, this, uh, in this geometry that gives you something that looks pretty much like this guy here. What deformation are you thinking of? So this deformation uh, would be um, turning on a CZ, you start from this background, we just uh, uh, B and H, and then you turn on some C0. So C0 and C, okay. Yeah, and which also sources a bunch of other things. Okay. Yeah. I was just wondering whether you were thinking of that or, um, so that's turning on a room, not a remote uh, flux per se, but turning on a, a potential remote potential. Yeah, but then to solve the supergravity equations, you also have to turn on a bunch of other things. Yeah, yeah. No, but but there's another deformation which you might also consider, which is that um, the um, D brains uh, and NS brains in the background come in doublets. It can mm -hmm. undergo an SL2Z, an SL2R rotation. Yeah, so yeah, 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 yeah. So you, so, okay, but you're not talking about that. I, I, I'm talking more about the, the, the C0, but for the, if you're only interested at looking at the spectrum of, uh, uh, of uh, short strings, actually these two deformations give you the same, the same picture, at least qualitatively. So is it, is it thing on C0? So C0 is massive in this background, right? It's a linear combination of C0 and C4. Yeah. Which is a, which is, which is a, yeah. So one combination yeah. is a fixed scalar and the other combination is, yes. a, is a true modulus. There's an actual, okay. So there's an actual Roman modulus. Yeah. There's a quartet of them, actually. Yeah. Strictly speaking, there is a quartet. I was thinking there is, then there is some SU2 and uh, three of them go into three and the other one goes into one. It's uh, qualitatively, actually, you could use any of them. There are, of course, some subtleties, yeah. but some differences, but qualitatively, you can use any of them. Okay. And, what, what, and what are the pontins? Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, are the pontins? So it's the, it's the, it, well, it depends on whether you're in the NS frame or the Ramon Ramon frame. Well, let's say if we're in frame three, it's mm -hmm. the, um, it's the uh, self dual or anti self dual, I forget which. Um, um, components of the C, the C two field, with uh, oh, both oh, legs on yeah. the T four. Yeah. Okay. So it's a torus Ramon module. Yeah. So there, there are three coming from the Ramon Ramon two form, and then this uh, linear combination of C zero and C four yeah. that, that forms a hypermultiplet of module. Yeah. Precisely. Thank you. Uh, okay. So now let me tell you some some words about how you can study these theories. At least my understanding, people in the audience are very, free, very much free to, to correct me. But essentially, three is, I would say, very well understood from the point of view of doing CFT on the worksheet. I think that you can use the Zumino Witten techniques. You have to be careful because you have this non-compact um, group and uh, there is some subtlety there, but these subtleties are more or less understood and you can compute Certainly the spectrum, and in fact, you can even compute more. You can compute even three-point functions, four-point functions, and so on. Now, as soon as you go into, into this territory, it becomes very, very hard. That's my understanding, and my understanding is also that there are techniques like uh, this so-called hybrid form is also a very good and bit, and that in principle are really designed to deal with this sort of picture. And you can certainly write some uh, some equations for this that involve a system of ghosts that then you cannot really solve. And in a sense, you know, like, it's sort of, if you believe that the answer is going to be something crazy like this for the spectrum of a given state, you shouldn't be surprised that you cannot just act freely with some uh, uh, Katsumudi algebra generators and impose some level matching condition or some Villazaro physical state condition on top to get the spectrum. I mean, you have to have some very, uh, 
non-algebraic mechanism that gives you the spectrum, like solving a differential equation, solving an integral equation, solving a recursive system of ghosts, or something like that. Okay. Now, what I want to say is how you can go around this problem and use the techniques that have been successful in ADS5 cross S5 and ADS4 CP3 as well to solve this theory in the cases one, two, and three, at least for what concerns the spectrum. And I claim that this is possible. And I will also say that basically this has been done in case three, where of course it was not really necessary to do it because it was already understood. And it's pretty much done in case one, and we are doing it in case two. Okay. Questions up to this point? Okay. I think I will do this. Think of questions while I raise the board. So I will try to give you just a flavor of the integrability construction because it can get pretty technical. But since there are many ADS3 experts, I want to rather than talk about integrability, which I could do for several hours, I, I want to give you a rough picture of integrability and then go a little bit into the details of this particular ADS3 model. Okay. Because there are some features that emerge from integrability that are actually simple enough that you can write them on the board. And they are quite intriguing. They show you where the difference between the NS and S background, the tensor the Witten case, and the one with Ramon Ramon fluxes appear in the integrability construction. So let's start with the good news. I'll write the good news over here. The good news is that in one, two, and three, in all the three cases, the equation of motion of the stream of linear sigma model, so I have some action for the string, in particular, I think I'm thinking of the Green Schwartz action. And I look at the equation of motion for these fields in the function of sigma and tau, the worship time and space. And then for two dimensional theory, there is a notion of being classically integrable, like sine Gordon is classically integrable and so on. And these guys are classically integrable. What does it mean classical integral? It means that the classical dynamics have an infinite amount of conserved charges that all commute among each other. And the equation of motion, which looks very nonlinear, can be solved as if they were linear. Okay. Among the conserved charges, there is the Hamiltonian of this model, certainly. And then what you could do if you were very mathematically inclined. You could say, well, now I just have to take this Hamiltonian and quantize it in a way that is compatible with all the symmetries, which is an incredibly difficult question. Even for much simpler theories like sine Gordon, which I mentioned, this is an incredibly difficult question. So what we are going to do is to take a shortcut and uh, take the idea of Alyosha and Sacha Zamologikov that they developed in 1978 for theories like sine Gordon and other similar theories, and say, let's assume that the 2D quantum field theory, which I get from quantizing in some appropriate way the string of linear sigma model. Is also integrable at the quantum level. The 
definition of this is no particle production? What is the definition of integrable at the quantum level? So nobody agrees on this. So there is no, whereas it's very precise in the classical level, it's a bit harder in the quantum level, but what we are going to do, I'm going to, I'm going to explain it in a moment. Yeah. And there I, there more or less, I mean, as careful as you can do in quantum field theory, which is not very, not very mathematically, but you can derive some properties, not of the Hamiltonian, but of the S matrix. I left into your comment. But before your comment, very important, the S matrix is on the worksheet. Word sheet. The worksheet is this thing where sigma and tau live. It's not the target space, and there is no string S matrix in the target space. Just an unfortunate thing that in string theory we have two S matrices. But I'm always talking about this auxiliary two-dimensional model. Okay? Now, some logical and some logical, they were not thinking about string theory at that point, they were thinking about a certain two-dimensional theory with a certain S matrix. And they found some consequences that I'm going to give you without derivation. They all come from the fact that you have these conserved uh, charges. And the idea is that, well, you're on a line, you prepare two states on the line, very far from each other, nice wave packet, and all that. And one has momentum P1 and velocity V1, the other has momentum P2 and velocity V2. And in the center of bus frame, they look a little bit like this, where time flows up like this, okay? They move like this. And here they do something extremely complicated that nobody really knows about. But then they fly off and they become again, the product of this scattering, they become well separated. And the consequence is that all that you have is that P1 and P2 going to P2 and P1. It's an elastic scattering without any particle production. There is more because you can also be a bit more daring and take P1, P2, and P3. So first of all, the repetition of the same argument, since you have infinitely many conserved charges, you can play it with for as many particles you want, tells you that actually, now you have just three particles going out and they have the same moment. But even more is true. You can take these three particles, they are on a line, and what will happen generically is that two of them will come together while the third one is somewhere far, far away. And that scattering effectively will just give you two particles again. So you can break this down into a sequence that looks more or less like this. Where first you scatter one and two, I'm not going to write the piece anymore, then you scatter three and one, and then you scatter two and three. Or you could have scattered in a different way because there is really nothing special about the order that I choose. And since the S matrix is a matrix, each particle can have many flavors. This condition here, this consistency condition, is actually a matrix equation on the S matrix, which is the famous Young Baxter equation. Here, I'm arguing that this is a consistency condition, but you could very well say that it's a, a, a that is a consequence of the existence of the conserved charges. There are conserved charges that act on this picture and transform it into this picture, or rather, unitary operator constructed out of these conserved charges. What is the interpretation of the 2D world sheet S matrix in term, in the bulk string theory? Does it have a uh, interpretation? In a moment, it's coming. I'm, I'm doing with time. Uh, we started five minutes late, so. Uh, 20 minutes, 25 minutes. Okay, I'm way behind schedule. Very good. So, uh, the take home thing of all this is we want to work with the S matrix, and if we know the two, if you know these two body S matrix, we can define the three body S matrix, we can define the four body S matrix, we can define all that we want. Yes. What was the role of 2D here? You said it was ah, you see, I, I kept saying that we are on the line and that particles yeah, meet. So that's just the that only works if you are in 2D. Imagine that you are in three dimension and particle meets like this, 
and then you know you move the velocity a bit and they stop meeting altogether. That's the poor man's way of putting the Kalema Mandula theorem, by the way. Okay, so now I want to do this on the worship of the string. First problem, the string theory uh, is uh, it has some gauge symmetry, right? Not all the modes of the strings are physical, there are transverse modes which we like and longitudinal modes that are not physical. And when you work with these matrices, it's very nice if you can work only with the physical excitations. There is also another problem that will come in a moment that eventually we are actually not interested in this two-dimensional model, but we are interested in the energy of the strings. The energy of the strings is the eigenvalue of the energy operator in target space. So in target space, there is a time direction, that's a symmetry. And there is a generator of this symmetry, which is the energy in ADS. And what we want to compute is this thing, not the thing on the worship. So fortunately, there is a way to solve both problems in one first book. And it is in string theory, we want to use light congauge. A particular light congauge, I don't, want, I don't want to define in too much detail, but the idea is that we have some coordinate x plus on the string, which I can define maybe as t plus phi. So t is time in ADS3, and this guy is some S1, a great circle of S3. And I say that this is equal to tau, which is time on the worship. And because this is the case, then the energies will also be related. Okay? So what we will find is that the worship Hamiltonian is related to some combination of the symmetries in target space. And I'm going to write the combination just because it's easier to write it right away like this. So this guy is the is an SL2 R carta. This is another SL2 R carta. And these two guys come from the C2s. So let's now have a quick look at how these guys come from ADS3 cross S3. Cross T4. So I said before that there is a bosonic algebra, which is SO2,2 plus SO4. And if I further decompose this thing in SL2 plus SL2 plus SU2 plus SU2, these are precisely the four cartons of this algebra. But there is more. In ADS3 cross S3 cross T4, there is actually a supersymmetry. Well, there are 16 of them. So you have two copies of this algebra PSU1, y slash 2. You also have a bunch of stuff from the T4, some bosonic symmetries, because you have essentially an SO4 locally on the T4 for you ones. Not very important for us. So this guy here is exactly the SL2 that I had before, and this guy here is exactly the R symmetry as you do. So the bosonic part are exactly these guys. Okay. Then in here you have four Qs and four S's. And I call them Q and S's because I already think of the conformal symmetry, where these are supersymmetry generators, these are superconformal generators. And in here you have four Q tildes and four S tildes.
for a total of 16. Okay. Of course, in SF2, in here, I will write it here, plus, of course, the SL2, which were the L0, the L plus minus 1, and the SU2, which was not only the J3, but some J plus minus. And, uh, of course, the other generator of SU2 in here. So all these give you all the generators of this algebra, and with the filters, you get the same thing. Now, so when you choose this light cone gauge, are you thinking of taking some kind of BMN limit? That's this light cone gauge. You can think it, think of it as coming from a BMN geodesic that moves on the time direction and on this grid circle, some point-like string solution in that direction, and that's the most supersymmetric configuration that you can find. And I'm going to show you in a moment that it preserves some the supersymmetry. So another thing that follows from this algebra, which I was almost forgetting, is that the algebra PSC1, 1, 1 slash 2 has a BPS bound. And from this BPS bound, it follows, sorry for jumping a bit, that L0 minus J3 is greater or equal to L0, and L0 tilde minus J3 tilde is greater or equal to L0, which also tells you that the worksheet Hamiltonian is positive semi-definite. It's not strictly positive because there are BPS states in this in this theory. Okay. Now, oh. if I want to find the S matrix, the S matrix will commute with whatever symmetries I have in my light cone gauge. So in particular, it has to be given by the symmetries that sub survive the gauge fixing. And the symmetries that survive the gauge fixing are the ones that commute with the worksheet Hamiltonian. Things that would change the worksheet Hamiltonian clearly are non linearly realized after I fix the gauge. So in light cone gauge, what happens? All raising and lowering. L plus minus and J plus minus are broken. That's clear because if I had L plus minus, no way it would commute with L zero, right? Or with A. And half of the Q, Q tildes, SL tildes, tildes are broken. And I'm left with an algebra which looks like so. I have two Qs, which are index A that can be one or two, and two S's. Yeah, broken, they're just ladder operators. Um, yes. I guess what I want to say is that they don't commute. They don't uh, they commute the with yes. They change energy. Yes, yeah. they're not broken. They, they are not broken. That, that, that's that's right. It's a. They just fill out a multiplet of the representation theory. Absolutely. Yeah. So broken is not the, the correct word to use here. Yeah. I, I apologize. Uh, That's the word that I was looking for, which is not the word. Okay. And I think you all know what is coming next. I can actually call this guy H and this guy H. And this is not surprising at all. What is surprising, I believe, or can be surprising, is this fact.
that this algebra gets centrally extended. These are not symmetries that were there before the gauge fixing. And in fact, these symmetries annihilate all the physical states of the theory. But if you have a non-physical state of the theory, these symmetries are extremely important. So why would you bother with the non-physical state of the theory? Well, I didn't really go that much into detail yet, for reason of time, but uh, a physical state satisfies the level matching condition. It's made up of a bunch of oscillators, which are basically particles on your worksheet, that have the property that the total momentum is zero. Imagine that I have three particles and their total momentum adds up to zero. That's great, but when I take the S matrix, I scatter them two at a time. So in a given pair, the total momentum is not zero. So I very much want to know if there is such a C. So this is the first thing that you find. Then you can also work a little bit more and say that if I have C and I act on a state that contains N particles, on the worksheet and excitation on the worksheet and modes of the strings is acts diagonally in this way. So this formula is intriguing for several reasons. First of all, it's actually immediately zero when the total momentum of this state is zero, modulo to pi even, because you could have some winding sectors. It depends on the parameter h, which is the strength of the Ramon Ramon background flux. So it's not there in the vessel middle written theory. And in fact, this is very similar to what appears in ADS5. The central extension was very famous before found by Bizer and Eichmann for Supreme Bees. Before it was found in ADS5, it was actually found in ADS3 by Gala and Arai. But they didn't see this because they were doing an airplane wave expansion, so they saw the leading order in some small p expansion of this thing. And they also saw that it was there in the Ramon Ramon background and not in the NSF. Okay, now I have this algebra and my particles. So, so because it's only yes. non-trivial on unphysical states, mm -hmm. how do you know you can't get rid of this uh, by a gauge transformation? A gauge transformation of what? Uh, I mean, is it is a set a level of this algebra, which is the algebra in which the so excitation it's in some transform sense, it's in some sense BRST trivial, right? Because for physical states. It, it's just zero? Yeah. So, so, so in what sense is there physics in this right-hand side of this equation? So uh, I have to say, I'm not sure of how to say, see these in the global theory, because I don't I, I understand the role of the central charge in the gauge fixed theory. I'm not sure you know, like how to see the, these, uh, these in uh, in a gauge independent way. Even if C is BRST exact, I guess it could be still useful in constraining the spectrum to have the larger algebra and representation theory and then zoom in on the exact, uh, on the closed sector, the, the BRST closed sector. Okay. Because what what I can tell is that, yeah, what I can certainly tell you is that it is useful and I should uh, uh, wrap up. So let me tell you a few ways in which this thing is useful. The first thing is that the representation, sorry, the particles of this theory will transform in representation of this algebra. And since this is a central element, I mean, uh, you, different representation will be exactly labeled by the value of C, essentially, right? So this value of H will matter, okay? These uh, particles are four modes, or rather two modes on ADS and two modes on the sphere, because one on, on ADS and one on the sphere have been gauge fixed away and four modes on T4. It turns out that the representation of this algebra in which, the, in which the particles transform are short. This algebra has a shortening condition. Which is simply this. And 
these representations are four dimensional. They consist of two bosons and two fermions. So I will have four representations. And I can go and study the S matrix that scatters these four representations. For each choice of the irreducible representations, there will be some S matrix that turns out to be first uniquely determined by this algebra up to an overall factor that you cannot fix by just computation additions. So the S matrix is fixed by this algebra. Second, it automatically satisfies the Jan Baxter equation. And third, it matches with perturbative calculation in the near BMN limit on the worksheet that you could do to check that whether what you are doing makes sense. So this structure is enough to fix the S matrix. The S matrix is not very complicated, but doesn't fit on the board. What does fit on the board is another thing, uh, which is the last formula that I want to write, which is the form of the energy on the worksheet, which is related to what we want, because what we want is essentially L0 plus L0 tilde, that's the energy in target space, as a function of the momentum of the particle of this parameter H, and if you also have an SMS fluxes of the parameter K that tells you the coefficient in front of the vesomino term. And this is the last thing that I, I want to write, this formula. There's a question, is the C uh, equation, is that going to be responsible for something like a CDD factor in aspect X? No, because it really changes the representation. Okay. The CDD factor is where, where this, this little mark that I said uh, that uh, the S matrix is fixed up to an overall prefactor. That's the CDD factor. The crossing equation is actually fairly complicated and is solved by a rather non trivial function that I'm very happy to tell you about <laughs> later. But, uh, so, this H as a function of the momentum, or rather, sorry, E worship, as a function of the momentum, this means. I have to under Hamiltonian on the worksheet on a part on a state that contains a single unlet, not level matched particle. And what is the energy? Well, the energy is this thing. So what do we have here? This guy here is the Ramon Ramon flux. Strength of the Ramon Ramon. This guy here is the SMS flux. This is the momentum. And this M is a number that characterizes different representation. I told you that I have some representation that have to do with ADS3 or LS3, some that have to do with T4. And it turns out that the ones that have to do with T4 are M equals zero. The one that have to do with ADS3 cross S3 or S3 have M equals plus or minus one. And then there is an additional level of complication because you start with this T with, in the S matrix bootstrap program, you start with some particles and then you realize that they can make bound states. So if you have m equal one, you can actually have m equal two, three, four. And if you have m equals minus one, you can have minus one, minus three, minus four. That's the one that So what is interesting here? This is absolutely not relativistic. It's, <laughs> it's very far from relativistic theory, which is not so strange because the worship of the string is not relativistic when you fix right from gauge. It's only true this is relativistic for flat spaces, in fact. Uh, this means that your S matrix is more complicated than in theories like sine Gordon and so. The other thing that is quite interesting is that if H is zero, the left and the right part of the algebra, the tilde and the non tilde part of this algebra, decouple, and this dispersion relation becomes chiral. In fact, you have just massless particles that move at the speed of light, either in one direction or on the other, up to this shift that looks a little bit like a background gauge field. One plus one per minute. This exactly reproduces the spectrum of the Vesomino Witten model. One comment for the specialist the S matrix also becomes very, very simple. It becomes the same as a TT bar deformation of a free theory. It becomes the same as for flat space strings. The only difference between 
the integrability picture for flat space strings and ADS3 strings is that you have this M here. This M is very important because it gives you, again, for the expert, all the spectra spectrally flowed sectors that you have in the mesomere of model. And then you immediately see that you turn on a tiny amount of this H, and the chiral structure, the split between left and right mover, is completely gone. Immediately, right? This thing comes how to the square root, and you have to treat it as such. So uh, I conclude by telling you what has been done again. So for the spectrum, we understand the S matrix, and you can use the S matrix to turn the crank of a machinery, which is called the thermodynamic beta ansatz. And this has been done for the NSNS case, and it has very recently been done for the case where you have the Ramon Ramon flux only, so you don't have this part here. And we're in the process of trying to do it when you have both of them which of course creates even more complication. There is a, a whole other story, which I didn't talk about in the slightest, which is how you can try to compute three and four point functions. And there is a machinery there, which was invented for an equal force superior base by Basso, Basso Tomazzo and Viera, and developed by myself and Burkhard Devin as well. And you can try to apply this machine here. It seems to work and we use it to compute the three point function of protected operators. So the, the three-point functional protected operators in this story are themselves protected, so they are a good test for your machinery, and they come out nice, they come out correct, but there is much more work to do. But all this machinery is very, it's not easy, it's awkward, and the, the structure, the functions, if I were to write them, they are quite daunting, okay? And then eventually, to get the finite, the finite value of k and h, you would have to put this thing on a computer and solve it numerically. But at least as a matter of principle, you can study all this stuff exactly. So that is my claim. And uh, yeah, I think I'm probably already over time, so I will stop here. But please ask questions. Yeah, questions? I'm confused by this dispersion relation. So mm -hmm. um, why is it periodic? Why is the second term periodic and P and bounded? Seems kind of weird, right? It's, it, says, so, it says that the, the spectrum is sort of almost flat. So the periodicity, the periodicity uh, is well understood in the case, let's put k equals to zero to keep things a little bit simpler. Mm -hmm. And then this dispersion becomes actually exactly the same as ADS5 and ADS4. And in that case, the periodicity means that there is an underlying lattice model representation of this story. And equal for superior miss can famously be represented as a spin chain. Mm -hmm. This sort of periodic Dispersion is typical of a spin chain. So this seems to indicate that in the D1-D5 system, really, when you only have Ramon Ramon flux and you go to Wigstein coupling, there should be a spin chain description of the model, which we don't know presently. This is what seems to me. What happens in general is extremely mysterious because you see that then periodicity is sort of spoiled by this term here. But you can also say that shifting p by p pi, it moves you in this space of m in a way that we are currently trying to understand. But uh, yeah, this periodicity to me is a signature of the existence of some underlying lattice description. But it's, it's, so if, it, if there were a lattice description, then there'd be a rewind zone and p would be... No, p no. is to uh, p uh, at least in the Ramon Ramon case, it's clear that p has to be between minus, minus pi and pi or something. Like that. Why? Why? Otherwise, you would not reproduce the spectrum of BPS operators. You will, you would be overcounting. Yeah. So 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 suppose I start with um, a k not zero but small, mm -hmm. and just deform the spectrum by taking k smoothly. But k is to be integer. K is k is quantized. You say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you again with h, but not with k. H is also quantized. You wouldn't know it. Yeah. And H, uh, H is a con I would treat it as a continuous parameter because you can tune it essentially by using G-string. I see. So, so you say if I truly tune K to zero, I just have a different a different animal where P is is uh, is periodic. Yeah, I think so. 
So uh, we uh, played a little bit with trying to obtain this pin chain from the brain construction. So what we did was basically to start with the usual story, the one, the five brains and stretch strings and so on, and then uh, integrate out uh, in a particular way, which is not the usual way that, uh, that you would do. The, uh, so you have this two-dimensional gauge theory, you flow to the IR, some of the um, some of the kinetic terms essentially dis disappear from your theory just by flowing in, in the IR. And then let me try to remember and not to say something stupid. Uh, you can integrate out the, um, the fundamental. So you have essentially a vector multiplet and a joint hypermultiplet and a fundamental hypermultiplet when you start with a picture of the D1, D5 strings. You flow to the AR and you can try to integrate out the, um, the fundamental so that you just are left with fields in the adjoint that you can think of essentially as matrices and used to construct single trace operators that are products of matrices like in a spin chain. The price to pay in this picture is that uh, this integrating out gives you a non-local theory. So, uh, Maybe later I, I, I can try to remember and sketch you how this goes, but essentially you have this integrating out is one loop exact, but your vertices are things that are described in terms of these, uh, uh, um, these bifundamental essentially uh, hypermultiple that you have integrated out. That could be a, big, a way to do this. And we constructed this, uh, this uh, effective Lagrangian and we checked that indeed it is integrable. We, we, we computed uh, some one loop Hamiltonian there. With respect to unequal force operators or something like that, it's quite hard to work with because it's not local. So your, your vertices and uh, propagators are really given in terms of some, some integrated outfield. Any more questions? Do it, I mean, when you make a gauge fix here, like the one you've done here, using the S1 as part of your like on do you miss anything? Is there any subtlety? There so any you do miss something because you're assuming uh, that there is no momentum on the T4 and there is no winding on the T4. On the T4? On the T4, yeah. I mean, oh, yeah, yeah. essentially, yeah. A, a, choosing an S1 on the sphere is completely fine because all S1s are the same on the sphere, but then you could have, you could have picked so you're essentially saying that your string is expanded around some reference BMN geodesic. And you could have picked a BMN geodesic that also goes in the T4. Oh, yeah. Oh, I see. Right? I see. Oh. So this is actually a sector of the theory. Uh, what you typically do in this case is that you start from this sector, and then you say that all the other sectors you can get by changing the boundary conditions of, of the fields on the T4. Confused, right? If I have light cone gauge and tendon in just flat space, mm -hmm doesn't require that the string is moving in the tau direction. It can be moving in any direction. Um, so the choice here is made to preserve as much supersymmetry as possible. The reason why I'm picking precisely these two directions. Yeah, okay, but... That's the, that's the rationale here. Otherwise, I would not have this nice algebra. But in principle, you could uh, pick any... Yeah, states, states that are moving on the T4 are not BPS. That's, that's a yeah, case. exactly. But that doesn't mean I can't describe them in this gauge. So uh, you can describe them in this gauge, but um, they are they are very heavy. State that have a macroscopic momentum around the T4. They are very heavy with respect to the ground state that you have chosen. I chosen a ground state where it's not equal to T4, and then you, we want to put essentially a bunch of small excitation of of. Yeah, well, they'll have, they'll have uh, energies which are of order alpha prime if the T4 yes. is of order alpha prime. Yes. But uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, but but eventually I would have I would have thought you would want to describe the whole spectrum, including all the oscillator excitations. So you're no, 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 you have all those. What, 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 I'm saying, what I'm saying is that uh, uh, you have on the T4, so you can put. Uh, Momentum, which you can do basically by putting many infinitesimal uh, excitations, but you could also have winding, and this I've not done here on the T4. 
and that you can do a posteriori by changing the boundary condition of these fields. So I, I, I didn't really dis discuss uh, what happens with the boundary condition of the field, but I've been saying things like level matching and so on. Uh, and it's a, it's a little bit more tricky if you want to really describe all the sectors of the theory, including things that have a winding on the T4 end, I would say, uh, I have to think a little bit, uh, I think for the momentum you are fine, it's just that you would need a, a macroscopic number of excitations essentially to, to get to a finite amount of moving on the T4. I'm confused. So, um, are the particle, I, I, I was under the impression that, that the things that are undergoing the scattering are modes of excitation on the string. Yes. So they're just oscillator excitations. Yes, that's right. Um, but then those are, I mean, if I'm close to the NS frame of this, then those are just modes of the currents. That's what they are, yes. In the yeah. NS frame, they're precise. So, so their gap is alpha prime. Yes. So there's no separation of scales between that and excitation. If the T4 size is alpha prime, then the gap there is also the T4 alpha. could have any, any size in principle, right? Yeah, okay. If you make it, if you, if, Fine. If you want I mean, to make I mean, well, I mean, excitations that are even lighter than alpha prime. No, I, mean, I just say that there is no. So in here, I'm not really made any assumption on what this what's the size of. Uh, I only made assumption essentially what what's the size of uh, ADS three crosses three, but not on the uh, on the size of uh, of T four. And the only thing that, the point is that these will be oh, these will be the important modes only in the limit where the T four is parametrically large. If the T4 is parametrically large, then the momentum modes on the T4 get lighter and lighter. Yeah, the other way around. T4 is string scale. Then, then these matter. I, I was giving him the worst case scenario. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, sorry. I, th I think that I'm saying something that is not quite right. Because you see, one thing that happens here. But there's also there's uh, also the current algebras on uh, for the one, just the one, 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 one second one second because what happens here is that you see when you have m equals to zero at p equals to zero you have zero modes here so m is zero p is zero sine p is zero okay now these zero modes could and they correspond to the bosons on the t4 and some fermions for the fermions these zero modes they're absolutely fine and they give you essentially the degeneracy of the BPS states. For the bosons, these zero modes, they are exactly like the zero mode of a free boson. So you don't want really to act with them, but you want to say that you can, there is a degeneracy on the spectrum because the T4 direction is flat and you can assign a momentum to that direction. That's how you, how you treat the macroscopic momentum. You don't really get it by, you know, acting the bunch of these zero modes. And you say that because you can act with a bunch of the zero, this, there, seems, there are zero modes, there are five directions, you act with some e to the i px, right? Yeah, 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 that's the zero modes. But I think but he, I Evo was talking about- your particles yeah. were the oscillator yeah. excitation. Yeah. Yes. On the, for each direction of the torus, there's a u1 current, which yes. has some mode expansion, which could also act on this ground state. Yeah, so the, and the I guess the non -zero, the non that the, so what, what I'm saying is that the non-zero modes, you can act as many times as you want, and those are perfectly captured by this, but the zero mode is not really captured Why by this. Why are they zero. perfectly captured by this? I, I don't I mean, think they're just some of the particles in, in the in this. No, but I thought this, this algebra does not include those U1 currents. This algebra includes the rotations of the S3 and the no, SL2R so in the ADS, the, the, but it the, does not include the, 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 the algebra. The algebra is the super is given by supercharges of this theory and some uh, so uh, let's put it this way. The represent, in the representation of the algebra, you have the transverse mode of, this, of the string, and among those, there are the four T4 bosonic coordinates to which you assign oscillators that create a mode that is charged under you know, SO4. And you want the particular you want that you have. So, so somehow your P label also includes a, so, a vertex operator label for the for those directions. So uh, I guess the issue is that I did I didn't describe for you what are the representation of, of this algebra, but essentially uh, 
they are four and they look like this. I, I, I promise it was the last formula, the previous one, but it's easier to just write it. So you have something like this. One representation would look something like this, where this y is on the sphere and this z is on ADS3, and these are fermions. Then you have another thing which looks like this. This is another mode on the sphere, and these are two fermions, and these are. But these are all multiplying the identity operator on T4. I think we were we were. And, not, and then you have two more fermions with with an index a dot, and then four bosons. Let me write it like this. It's a bit more symmetric. Sorry. These are, I told you that there are eight modules and eight fermions in the theory. They sit in modules of this algebra given by the Qs and the Q tildes. The algebra acts like this in this module. And there are two modules which are labeled by this index A dot, which corresponds to the fields on T4 and their fermionic superpartners. And what I'm saying is that you can take your vacuum and up with a bunch of these T4 modes, as long as they are not the zero momentum ones, which would not really make sense. Okay. So in other words, this energy formula is the part of the energy that does not come from the vertex operator. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. It's the part that comes from sort of the yeah, the short string, not from the versus operator that you have to deal with separately. And it will give you just the trivial. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I should have said it in that way from the beginning and it would have been clear. I apologize. I understand. Thank you. That clarified it. If there are any more questions, maybe we can keep them for later. And yeah. let's thank Alessandro again. <laughs> I think we should announce a dinner. Uh, yeah, there'll be a uh, there'll be a dinner. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, the spectrum will be kind of interlinked. No, you, you don't mind. Yeah, but there'll be no. There'll be no. Yeah. 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 Yeah.